Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Washington Times for this special episode of History As It Happens podcast. We're doing a special series of episodes about the Declaration of Independence. Why the Declaration of Independence again? Well, the subject may be old, but the issues are fresh. The American Revolution is current events. I actually got that line from our guest today. <laughs> Hello, Denver Brunsman, historian at George Washington University. Welcome to The Washington Times. Thanks, Martin. It's great to be here. Yeah, you know, I don't think I could get a better guest because you're the guy who teaches the classes about George Washington at the university named after him. And you teach them at Mount Vernon, too. Tell us a little bit yeah. about the work you do. Yes, yeah, so I'm incredibly lucky. Uh, I'm a professor and the chair of the history department at George Washington University. So I get to teach a range of classes on early American history, including the American Revolution, War of 1812, and the one you mentioned, my favorite, uh, George Washington and his world, uh, which takes place in his world at, George, you know, at his Mount Vernon estate uh, for GW students. That's exciting. Although, uh, on the other hand, George Washington didn't sign the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I mean, what a slacker, right? Yeah, I, I mean, know, he I know. What was he, what yeah. was he doing? Well, yeah, what he was, was he doing? <laughs> he was getting ready to fight the British, right? So he, he was in New York. Uh, just welcoming, you might say, <laughs> intercepting uh, the largest armada of soldiers and sailors ever uh, yeah. to cross the Atlantic to that point. About 30,000 British soldiers arriving in New York and, and Washington was there uh, waiting for them. That's right. And at this and around this time, uh, they're planning or already underway uh, an invasion of Canada as well. That's right. That's in right. Summer yeah. of 76. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize. I mean, we have Lexington and Concord in the spring of 1775. But this was a continental war by July of 1776. It's happening up and down the East Coast, uh, all the way into Canada, and uh, you know, all the way down to the southern colonies. Yeah. Uh, June of the prior year, the Battle of Bunker Hill. So yeah, war's already underway for more than a year. Maybe I needed to find the John Hancock professor at George Washington, because he had the biggest signature of the 56 people who signed the document. That's right. Well, anyway, I, I opened the, uh, the podcast by saying how the American Revolution is teaching current events. Well, that's what you told me. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so when I, when I talk to students, you know, one thing we do today, we need to do as educators is uh, show that history is relevant. And I don't think there's a more relevant event in American history than the American Revolution, because we live in the society and with the frame of government that it created. Uh, and, and so, you know, a lot of our politics today, uh, a lot of the same issues, I think, you know, go back to that period and you, you see these patterns. And uh, so I think if you can clue students into that, then they not only see the past in a different way, but you see your own world today in a different way. Yeah, I mean, we still inhabit the political world of these 18th that's century right. dudes. That's right, right? And I think that's why, that's why we're having this conversation. Yes, that's right. why we look back to this moment so much. Yeah. Not that uh, events were frozen forever in time. Yeah, Lots have happened. happened since then. There was Absolutely. a civil war just 80 years <laughs> later, right? Yeah. But I mean, I've often raised this question with some of my other guests on the podcast. Why do we go back to the founders or the framers of the Constitution or the, the revolutionaries of the 1770s for guidance, for advice? how to frame legislation today for um, guidance in our culture wars, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, these pre-modern, pre-Darwin men. Well, it's not really a profound question or answer. We're still inhabiting their political world. It, we're still on their constitution. Unlike the French, say, who may talk about Napoleon today, but they're on their, what, their 18th constitution or something like that. That's right, that's yeah. right. As Americans, we can point to the, the start of the country. There's a start date, and these are the people there that created it. And so they continue to influence us. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, the, the former prime minister of Britain, had this saying that the, the countries of Europe were forged by history, meaning they formed organically over time, whereas the United States was formed by philosophy. That is formed at a specific moment in time, and that's... A nation founded on ideas, yeah. right? Many origin stories are based on ethnicity, religion, culture, religion, whatever. Yeah. Although, I mean, whether or not you can point to a single date uh, the founding of a nation. Yeah. We'll get into that. Yeah. Uh, some say 1619 is a better date rather than 1776. We'll return to that issue in a bit. I mean, for most of my relatively short life, the revolutionary era always had this primordial place in our collective consciousness, as we've been discussing. Not necessarily a source of unity, but a common story, an origin story that was a source of inspiration for all Americans ever since, regardless of what uh, Jefferson in his pen with the editing of Adams and Franklin when he wrote those uh, infamous or famous words, timeless, immortal words, right? Regardless of what they meant at the time, those words were a, a source of inspiration for all of us, while the Civil War is the one that continues to divide us. But do you see that changing? Do you see the revolution as a source of division now, too? 
You know, maybe a little bit. I, I think it's still the event that I think most Americans embrace, uh, both sides, you know, liberals and conservatives, yeah. doesn't matter across the political spectrum. I think everyone can find something there that is inspiring. Um, but I think, you know, the, the job of scholars and of, of uh, research has shown that there are, you know, problematic things in yeah. our past, even in a past that we uh, embrace. And yeah. I think that's true with the Declaration. Well, certainly, the, and the Declaration and the revolution of which it was a part yeah. um, was not complete, right? It didn't yeah. end slavery, but you can also make the argument, and I do, that it kicked off the anti-slavery cause in this country, the first of its kind. Right? It certainly wasn't perfect, and wars, all wars are horrible, and they all affect average, ordinary people worse than the elites in society, for sure, yeah, so yeah. there's that. Um, I mean, w something you mentioned to me when we were getting, uh, preparing to get together here is that you know, the Declaration was always part of a long, progressive tradition in our country as a source of inspiration. Martin Luther King uh, at the March on Washington, uh, the anniversary is coming up this year. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. We have come to cash this check. Uh, 1848, Seneca Falls, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, her famous Declaration of Sentiments was read and adopted there, modeled after the Declaration of Independence. And September 2nd, 1945 in Asia. Do you know where I'm going with this? I do, uh, Vietnam, right? The yeah. Vietnamese independence. Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. Yep. Ho Chi Minh proclaims uh, the Independent Democratic Republic of Vietnam in Hanoi in front of a massive audience. I mean, the yeah. World War II is over, the French had yet to try to yeah. recolonize Vietnam. And the first lines of his speech repeat verbatim the uh, second paragraph of America's yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't even change them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, th I think that when Jefferson writes those words and they're adopted by the Continental Congress on July 4, 1776, you know, all men are created equal. And I think ever since then, any groups in American society that didn't, weren't experiencing equality yeah. certainly wanted a piece of that, whether it was uh, marginalized people of color, whether it was women. You know, you mentioned uh, Seneca Falls. You know, they, their Declaration of Sentiments is all men and women are created equal. Yes. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think it was, it was really kind of a beacon. It was a, a goal for, for different groups. And, and I think that's still true. I mean, I think it's still used in different social movements uh, because it's incredibly mm -hmm. powerful, you know, inspiring yeah. words. So it is a fair question, uh, referring to my previous yeah. somewhat tangled question yeah, about yeah, what yeah. they meant versus the inspiration yeah. that came later. It's a fair question as to what Jefferson and company did mean, just using the word man, for instance, all sure. men are created yeah, equal. Yeah. Did they mean only males yeah. or all human beings? Yeah. I mean, you can get really semantic yeah. about this, but what's your take on that? Yeah. Yes, I, I see this um, in, in two ways. I, I think in an enlightenment sense, you know, this is the age of enlightenment, yeah. this age of reason in which they talked in universals. I think on one level, Jefferson is saying um, certainly all men and, and, and all humans. And I think, that's, I think it's an as abstract level. Mm -hmm. um, I think in uh, reality, certainly in Jefferson's reality, um, that phrase, you know, if written in a very legalistic sense would say all white men are created equal because that was, you know, that was the gains of, of different groups uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the revolution. You know, they weren't, they weren't equal. Uh, but, but, you know, I think that throughout time, other folks have taken those words and have also thought of them in universal ways. Another one is Abraham Lincoln yes. in the Gettysburg Address. When he quotes, um, you know, when he quotes Jefferson, he's saying all men, right, black and white are created equal. Uh, so, so, I think one thing we should be grateful for as Americans is, is our country was born in this time of enlightenment, of, of the sort of these ideas of, uh, and ideals of universal liberty. I, I gave you a copy of the yeah, Declaration yeah, yeah. of Independence. Yeah. yeah, I have one too. <laughs> I went to the National Archives today. There's a guy outside just handing these out. I'm like, isn't this like a rare document? How can oh, it was just printed. No, actually, I printed this. As long this. as it wasn't Nicolas Cage, right? Yeah, <laughs> I have not seen that movie. No, uh, the grievances, yeah. the grievances yeah. that are listed here, yeah. these don't hold up as well, I don't yeah. think, to, to scrutiny. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about the grievances. Uh, this is my interviewing style. I'm kind of like in a maze. You never <laughs> quite know when they're on the next turn where you're going to be headed. We'll return to the grievances in a moment. Yeah. About the radicalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, the radicalism. Yeah. 
uh, I think we need to remember that radicalism, yeah. right? That's why I opened the podcast by saying the subject is old, but the ideas are fresh. The idea that fundamental human equality could be the guiding principle of a new nation. I don't think anyone has articulated this idea better than Gordon Wood. I have his seminal work here, The Radicalism of the American Revolution. As you know, I cite books okay. during my podcast okay. because as a journalist, Which is I great. Have, I have so to it's cite. Like a, it's like a graduate seminar at uh, GW. <laughs> exactly. I have to cite my sources as any good journalist would. And also, I want to introduce people to these ideas or books if they're not familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, this is in the introduction of this book. The revolution did more than legally create the United States. It transformed American society. He says the changes were radical and they were extensive. He says to focus, as we are today apt to do, on what the revolution did not accomplish, rather uh, to highlight its failures to abolish slavery, for instance, is to miss the great significance of what it did accomplish. He says it made possible the anti-slavery and women's rights movements of the 19th century, and in fact, all our current egalitarian thinking. It radically changed the personal and social relationships of people, including the position of women. It destroyed aristocracy, as it had been understood in the Western world for at least two millennia. It brought respectability and even dominance to ordinary people long held in contempt and gave dignity to their menial labor in a manner unprecedented in history. I think to sum that up would be to say the colonists, now American citizens, viewed themselves as citizens rather than subjects. It was a revolution in that it reordered society. It overturned the existing order. And people start to think about themselves and their relationship to others and their government differently. Absolutely. And uh, I, I could teach a class about <laughs> this. No, but go ahead. Well, that was very good. Uh, <laughs> No, I think, it, I think in that change from yeah. subjects to citizens, it does show that transformation, and, and it was revolutionary, that a subject under the crown is inherently unequal, mm -hmm. right? This is a stratified society uh, with all kinds of you know, different positions based on birth, um, whereas a citizen, by definition, is equal, right? And so that's, as you say, it's transforming society. And, and I'm a friend of, of Gordon Wood, and, and oh, it's, a, it's a fabulous uh, book, and he's a, obviously an amazing scholar. I think the one critique would be that there's a lot happening in that period with groups that weren't included in the definition of citizen yeah. that were actually radical, too. I think the revolution maybe was even more radical in, in many respects than, than maybe even Wood at least writes about in that book. And it's certainly yeah. not anything he doesn't know, yeah. but in terms of African Americans prosecuting for their... Uh, freedom and equality for women uh, you know, mm -hmm. to be included. Um, I think it just shows how powerful these ideas were. Well, absolutely. Um, enslaved Africans were not included, we know. But shortly after the revolution, you start to see free black societies in the north yep. where slavery starts to give way, putting together petitions and petitioning their local governments, their state governments, even Congress. Quakers show up to the first Congress saying, all right, let's get rid of slavery. Well, you know, it took another 80 years, yeah, as we know, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least on a national level, right, yeah. with the 13th Amendment in 1865. But yeah, these radical impulses, even if they didn't include people right from day one, and it wasn't like plebeians start running the place immediately, right? Mm -hmm. I think Jefferson, who was probably the most democratical of all the founders, probably still thought that ordinary people had a kind of place in society and that shouldn't be running society. But there was a leveling effect. I guess that's the word I'm yeah, looking at. There was yeah. more of a leveling effect. And this is, what, this is something that would writes about that, yeah. that I think is right on that that it's it's kind of a Pandora's box that the that the founders you know yeah. open that yes. they uh, they are elites and most of them are elitist and they didn't necessarily originally envision regular people participating in government and certainly in an equal way mm -hmm. uh, but that's what happens right within a generation after the revolution uh, and that's Wood's large point is that you know white men who would had no sort of equality in Europe and particularly no, no, in Britain. No, no. Uh, would experience that in the United States. Um, yeah, I mean, we can, it, it is easy to fall into the trap of scrutinizing the founders' personal lives and calling them hypocrites. Yeah. We do lose sight of the bigger picture. I mean, both things can be true, that Thomas Jefferson was hypocritical because he was a lifelong slave owner and only freed a handful of his slaves. They were his flesh and blood for yes. the most part. Yeah, his children. Yes, yeah. his children. So, okay, uh, we agree. The Declaration <laughs> was radical. Um, <laughs> 
It's not a long document, yeah. the Declaration. Well, yeah. either is the Constitution. I mean, I think that's why it's great. It's yeah. brief. The brevity makes it yeah. uh, powerful. Yeah. Students like that. Yes. <laughs> um, that's right. You can read. I got this book over here about the Enlightenment that's like 900 pages long. I mean, they fit the Declaration of Independence in like two pages. That's right. Uh, most people have not read the list of grievances, probably since their high school or college history classes. But I, I do want to get into this soaring opening language a little bit more. Uh, penned by Jefferson with the help of Adams and Franklin. Uh, we talked about whether they knew they were writing for the ages. What was their inspiration? Because this is important. Some people read these opening words. Um, let's see here. Uh, this, uh, let's see. Uh, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Uh, any reference to God often makes... Some people say, well, that's a reference to Christianity or, or religion when it wasn't. This was Lockean natural rights, John Locke. Uh, historians have gone back and forth about how important was Locke in, in influencing the American Revolution. He seems to have made some of it a comeback lately. Uh, what does Denver Brunsman say about John Locke's influence on, on the revolution? Yeah, so Jefferson is a, is a master synthesis. He's bringing together all these different Enlightenment ideas, and certainly Locke, particularly in his second treatise of government, I think that's uh, you know, one of the primary things he's drawing from. Yes. He's also drawing from the Scottish Enlightenment, people like David Hume um, and Adam Smith. Uh, some of the language about equality comes from them. Um, Franklin made it a critical edit in the Declaration at one point. Uh, the original uh, words said, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. That's Jefferson's language. Franklin takes his pen to it and says, no, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That's straight from Scottish moral sense philosophy, Interesting. this idea that you just know things as, as a human being. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing that just with such a small edit, they're introducing a whole other sort of branch of philosophy. Yeah. So I think, if it's self-evident, yeah. why do you have to say it? Yeah, but that yeah. is an Enlightenment idea, yeah, common yeah. sense. Yeah, right? Applying yeah. common sense. Common sense, moral sense, yep, yeah. yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Locke, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about classical antiquity? All right, so I mentioned I have this massive yeah. book here about the Enlightenment. Uh, this is written by Richie Robertson a couple years ago. Um, and I'm going to go back to, what, page 708? All right. So he We're not said, making this stuff up. No. It's coming straight from the text. <laughs> Historians have wished to place the founding of the American Republic within two historical and intellectual narratives. One is the influence of Locke. The other is uh, the lasting importance of classical Republican theories, classical antiquity. Uh, Plato, for instance, although Plato is no Democrat. Um, and I think when John Adams realized that Plato really wasn't uh, the equalitarian that he imagined him to be, he was a guest. Uh, whereby the Republic depends on civic virtue and demands the participation of all of its citizens. Uh, Bernard Balin, in his seminal work, which I have over here, the intellectual or oh, I'm sorry, the ideological origins of the American Revolution, forgive yeah. me for that, uh, says that classical antiquity was kind of window dressing. That yes, all enlightened and educated men such as, well, Jefferson actually did know the classics, yeah. but many of the other pamphleteers at the time were kind of just like what we do now on the internet. We pull a quote we find <laughs> and just, you know, to dress up our arguments without yeah. really understanding yeah. the text. Do you agree with that? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, you know, different scholars are working on this, and I think there's some debate, you know, when there's, uh, this is a term in history, contested ground, you know, how, yeah. how deeply are they into the, the ancients, into the <laughs> classical period? Uh, but I agree with what you say, that it, it's kind of like, the entry card into some of these debates. You have to yeah. show that you are familiar. You know, even George Washington, who uh, never read Latin or Greek, yeah. um, is getting the secondhand English version of these things and and using that in his letters. So it, it was kind of a sign of credibility that you, yeah, but they you were in the club, right? Yeah, they weren't trying to create a new Sparta, yeah. though. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That's yeah, right. I think the Lockean and others like him uh, yeah. is, is a more important uh, yeah. influence. How were these enlightened, or should say, were these enlightened ideas audible at the level of ordinary citizens? So it's the summer yeah, of 76, yeah, right? And yeah. public opinion is still kind of yeah. not quite sure where it's going when it yeah. comes to declaring yeah. independence. Wars wouldn't been underway for a year. Are ordinary citizens yeah. talking about Locke? Yeah. Maybe not Locke, but definitely I think some of these other parts of the declaration that Jefferson is writing about. And, and I think the ideas are filtering down the way we talked about. They're mm -hmm. reaching the, the broader public. Uh, the Declaration is being read, you know, publicly in, in different places. And, and so, you know, regular people might not know the origin of these ideas, but they sound pretty good, right? If you're living in a society in which um, you, you're impoverished, that you're, you're not born into a station of equality with other people, 
and all of a sudden someone is telling you that, oh yeah, you're actually equal. You're as equal to the you know, highest member of this society, of, of, of George Washington, or if King George III was part of <laughs> our yeah. side, you would be on the same station as them. Uh, well, that's an idea that I think you know, regular people can understand and, and embrace. Common Sense by Thomas Paine comes out in January of 76. Yeah, that yeah. had a profound influence, yeah. I think, on ordinary people, but yeah. not, not the men at the Second Continental Congress. Yeah. Yes and no. So, um, so Common Sense, you're absolutely right. Runaway bestseller, yes. that's what we call it today, right? The, the second most printed book in the history of the colonial period, right, right after the Bible. Wow. Uh, and that's it's, pretty good company. You know, and for every copy of it, historians have figured that you know, several people are reading it because it's left in coffee houses and taverns and it's passed around. Um, and it, you know, it's, it, it, it helped to certainly move hearts and minds. And so the members of Congress, I don't think Payne is telling them anything that they didn't know. But the way politics works today, where pressure can come from below, uh, we certainly see that happening with Payne because shortly after, uh, between April and June of 1776, there's almost 90, there's been 88 that have been counted, but 88 local declarations of independence. How about that? These are different communities, um, colonies, associations, all writing basically saying that we should be independent. And they're trying to inst instruct their delegates and, and uh, representatives at the Continental Congress and in the state legislatures that this is what we believe. And so, um, while Payne might not have affected, say, Thomas Jefferson that much, Jefferson is affected by these ideas and these yeah. local declarations, and then he's affected by you know, George Mason's uh, Declaration yeah. of Virginia. So it's all in the air. Where'd the Continental Congress get its authority and legitimacy from? Because it it meets for the first time in August of 70, autumn, August, September, autumn of 1774. Yep. Uh, the idea of even having a Congress was highly controversial. Uh, the crisis had been underway for many years already. And, you know, less than two years to declaring independence. Uh, it seems that they got some of their legitimacy from the provincial assemblies that had replaced royal rule in the different colonies, the 13 states, as we would call them later on. Yep. But that Congress was super superior to them, though, had supremacy when it came to political decisions. Yeah, well, well, that's the debate that would continue on, you know, under the Articles of Confederation into the 1780s. But in terms of the original Continental Congress, it's like so much of America, and I, I say this, uh, it sounds funny, but I, it, it's true, it's made up, right? It's, yeah. it's created, uh, just like the country was, was created, it was invented. And so the Continental Congress was not a standing organization, it wasn't created by Parliament, um, it's put together by the different colonies, and I think you're absolutely right. It gets its authority because the, the colonies say that it has authority by sending delegates to that place. And at that very first Continental Congress that you mentioned, um, more of the delegates had been to London than had been to Philadelphia. That's amazing. And that sh so that shows what they had in common was this British identity. They don't even think of themselves at that point well, as provincials. Americans. Right? They're provincials. They're provincials. And it would take time for them to even you know, embrace the, the term American. Samuel Adams, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first time he ever left Massachusetts was to go to the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In 74. So they were like provincial provincials. Okay. <laughs> so we started at 30,000 feet up, talking yeah, big picture, yeah. esoteric, enlightenment ideas. We're going to start to get to ground level now okay. and talk about the more pragmatic, pragmatic rather, prosaic concerns that the delegates at the Continental Congress who were, <laughs> you can call them the, the leaders of the revolution at this point, yeah. uh, are are thinking about and grappling with the grievances, right? You, you told me that scholars are paying more attention to the grievances now rather than the soaring opening third of the document. Why is that? Yeah, so I think there's a few different reasons why scholars are focusing on the grievances. One just has to do with the way the academy works, that people had written about the beginning of the declaration <laughs> for so many years <laughs> that you know, we're expected to come up with new insights and, and, and new knowledge. And, and, you know, in, I think in the, in the 70s with the bicentennial into the 1980s, there's lots of books that argue that there's this one person that influences Jefferson more than anyone else, right? And I think, it, I think the consensus now is that he's influenced by a lot of things. And like eclectic, I said, an and, eclectic mix. Yeah, and it's a synthesis. And, yeah. and so scholars have moved on and they're looking at the grievances. And one advantage that has is it can get you more into events on the ground, things that actually happened in the 1760s and 1770s. Because what those grievances do is they're, you know, they're, it's a litany of, of complaints. About, about the king. Uh, about the king. And, 
And Not so much Parliament yeah, at this point. Yeah, so I guess, let me, yeah, if you don't mind me interjecting, yeah, yeah. sorry, uh, Denver, why did they feel like in this you know, pub very public document, they had to make a break with King George when the crisis had really been about Parliament sovereignty. Yeah, yeah, so there's a couple of things going on there. Um, one thing is they're, they're, this is very much modeled, speaking of inspiration, on um, the English Bill of Rights, which is uh, written in, in 1689. This is right after the Glorious Revolution. And this is just kind of the way English-speaking people you know, declare independence. They separate from the king, it's, it's the king. The other thing is that it's a product of what happened in the 1760s and 70s. At a certain point, the Americans say that they no longer will follow the authority of parliament, that the parliament does not govern for them. They still recognize the, the authority of the king. And so that's sort of their last connection to the British Empire. Yeah. And there's a fair argument to be made that the American colonists were more royalists than people in England, meaning for a long time they had actually loved the English monarchy um, even more than, than, than people in I think, England. I think you say the same thing today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Just, any, just read any tabloid, right, at a supermarket. That's all. <laughs> I did not watch the coronation of uh, whoever the king is now. I, I mean, in true American sense, uh, this unearned privilege and this, this uh, silly pageant putting the crown that's, on the guy's that's head. Your, that's your own protest. That's yeah, right. That's my own bias showing right there. Yeah, I mean, the, King George III was a fairly popular figure for a while. Very popular, very popular. And even, so even George II, who was his grandfather, yes. um, still didn't speak English because these were German-born yeah, uh, kings. Uh, George III is the first to do so. So George II was kind of a malign figure in, in Britain. He wasn't that popular. Uh, and then when he died, the Americans are so sad. They're forlorn. You know, there's all these sermons about how great George II was. And there's so much optimism and hope for George III. And, and of course, that quickly dissipates. Uh, uh, given the different policies that Britain pursued. I think there's something like uh, 28, 27? Uh, 27, yeah. 27 grievances, almost all of them, they're all a sentence apiece, yep. most of them, almost all of them begin with he. Yep. He has refused, he has forbidden, he has refused, yep. he has called together, he has dissolved, <laughs> he has refused, he has endeavored. Yeah. Um, Andrew Roberts wrote a favorable biography of George III, yes. which I read a, another, Matt. You know, the nice thing about this book is when you're done reading it, you can use it as a doorstop. <laughs> use it as a doorstop. Uh, the Misunderstood Reign of George III. And yeah. I'm going to share something with, again, you know, he's more favorable towards George III than maybe some other scholars are. Sure. He uh, says here, the Declaration of Independence is simultaneously grotesquely hypocritical, <laughs> illogical, mendacious, and sublime. And <laughs> The parts that he refers to as mendacious are the grievances, yeah, uh, yeah. particularly the one blaming, well, that one actually didn't make it into the Declaration, but the, the mention of slavery that finally made it in yeah. to the final, um, yeah, the yeah, here you go. The 27th actually, grievance. Yes, the final grievance. Yep, yep. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Okay, that's a little hyperbo hyperbole there. That's, that's um, the part we, uh, we don't read in July 4th picnic. That's right, right we yeah. don't. <laughs> so on the one, on one hand, Jefferson's saying the king is inciting slave revolts, and he's also inciting uh, Indian in warfare on the frontiers. Yep, yep. Um, this is an ex post facto justification for a revolution that's already underway. Do you agree? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, what you see at the grievance is even more than the opening part. You know, I talked about the, the hard politics mm -hmm. where they're trying to attract supporters. Um, and, you know, I think that this is, you know, we'd say today in the 21st century, this is racist language, right? This is, yes, this is language, uh, a terrible language against Native Americans. And when he's saying he's incited domestic insurrections, he's talking about slave rebellions, particularly in Virginia, by the governor of Virginia, uh, Lord Dunmore, yes. uh, to free African Americans who came to the British side. So you know, this is part of our revolution that I think makes it fascinating and complex. Uh, but the majority of African Americans and Native Americans at that time uh, side with Britain, and and this is yes. you know this is one of those things again, teaching students uh, that that. They're excited to learn, and I think it opens their mind to some of the other parts of the, of the document. Yeah, many thousands of enslaved black people were emancipated as a result of the Revolutionary War. Yep. That is different than saying the British were trying to end the institution of slavery or that any colonists 
fought the revolution, declared independence, broke with the crown to defend slavery. And this is my problem with the 1619 Project. It takes some real evidence and then draws a false conclusion. The American Revolution was not a pro-slavery revolt, despite what Jefferson wrote here, right here, in uh, Grievance Number 27. Yeah, so I think, you know, one thing that I teach about this, and it's quite different than teaching about the Civil War. Uh, no professional scholar that I know of right now would disagree with the statement that slavery caused the Civil War. Slavery, you know, caused the Civil War. You can't make the same blanket statement about anything for the American Revolution. Right. There's all these policies, you know, beginning in 1763, going up through the 1770s, uh, uh, that all kind of come together. And the big point that the Americans are getting at is that they wanted to control their own destiny. They wanted to be sovereign over their own affairs. They wanted to determine you know, what would happen in their lives. Now, if there was one thing that did, I think, cause <laughs> independence, that kind of pushes it over the edge, it's the war. The war starts uh, more than a year before the Declaration. And Washington is already in charge of Washington's the Continental already Army. In yeah. some ways, he's the first to declare independence, I think, by taking charge of the, of the army. And so these slave rebellions connect, connected to Dunmore, that which never really materialized. the 1619 Project is getting yeah. into, yeah. Um, they are part of the war. So, I, so they're very unpopular. And, they're, and you can tell they're unpopular because they're included in the Declaration. Yes. Um, so now that's different than saying slavery caused the American Revolution. Yeah. Is it a, does it contribute like a lot of these other things? I think it does, and it depends on the region, it depends on the person, and it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Dunmore himself, on Christmas Eve of 1774, is writing in his papers, we have these, this, these are definitive. Yeah. He's already lost the colony by that point, so yeah. I don't know if it could be called a tipping point. Uh, his proclamation saying all enslaved people who reach British lines, you get their freedom. I mean, that was true. That did happen. And as I mentioned, thousands of enslaved black people were emancipated, yeah, military emancipation. Yeah, yeah. But again, that's different than saying that any colonists. I mean, yeah. what the, the language the 1619 Project uses now is some colonists, yeah. uh, which is... Which uh, was a good correction. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, some, sometimes the way both our politics and scholarship can yeah. work sometimes is that there's an overcorrection. So let's say 20 years ago, very few people knew who Dunmore was. Yeah, more knew, people know Dunmore now than ever. anything about this proclamation, right? <laughs> yes. They didn't think that slavery maybe had anything at all to do with the revolution. Now, now it was an exaggeration to say that it caused the whole thing. Yeah. I think so. But if, if we land somewhere you know, in, in, that, in that spectrum, you know, I think that's productive. I think that's. I would agree know, with that. Yeah. I think the initial language yeah. was, a, was a primary yeah. cause. Yeah. Now it's some colonists yeah. and yeah. all. But yeah. as far as those slave revolts that Dunmore was threatening or maybe even trying to instigate, yeah. they never materialized. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, they, yeah. And, and, and the irony is that uh, everything he does uh, backfires. I mean, yeah. actually. <laughs> and he was an enslaver himself. Yeah. yeah. He was an enslaver. And yeah. many of the African Americans who did reach yeah. British lines suffered yeah. terribly. I mean, yeah. Uh, from disease and other conditions. Yeah, he's, and all. He, he's no humanitarian. And I think it's no. just worth pointing out that um, that whole episode is prompted by enslaved African Americans themselves yes. actually trying to become free. They're creating a lot of instability that then Dunmore tries to capitalize on. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, they know if war breaks out, and of course, uh, the rebellion was already underway in Virginia, this is an opportunity for them. Yeah, it's an absolutely, opportunity for absolutely. them. Yeah, recovering that part of African American history is very, very important. Yeah. So um, let's get into the timing of, okay. yeah. of the declaration yeah. because there's like this kind of nebulous gray area. The colonists were in open rebellion, but they weren't quite independent yet. And there were moderates, if we can call them that, hoping to reconcile. Still, even fairly late in the game, although their own demands, even the moderates' demands, and all their behavior was pointing towards you know, a lack of reconciliation, yeah. right? Because Parliament and King would never accept uh, a situation where they did not have authority over what was happening in the colonies. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a very brief uh, and abridged timeline of some okay. of the important stuff. So I mentioned yeah. Continental Congress, autumn of 1774. Yep. The colonists then formed provincial or extra legal assemblies yep. uh, because the, the royal assemblies or the royal governors are, are out. Yeah, um, they're defying acts of parliament. War begins at Lexington and Concord. Then the Battle of Bunker Hill, June 1775. Royal authority collapsing in colonies. Uh, then the colonists eventually create new governments, legal governments, which is in a sense independence. Right? These are not just yeah. provincial, temporary, ad hoc committees running things. 
August 23rd, 1775, King George III declares America to be in a state of rebellion because uh, the Wi-Fi wasn't working that day. It took until uh, October, or I don't know if it was October, but about three months later. It, yeah, 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 about October. A couple months, yeah. Yeah, for the colonists to learn. The Continental Congress yeah. doesn't know that they're in open rebellion yeah, yeah. Uh, per the king for three months. Why did it then take another eight months or so to declare independence? Yeah. I think that gets back to what we were talking about before about how British these people were, <laughs> you know, how much they loved the king. And, and there's a term that's been in the academy for a long time, and it's finally coming seeping down into high schools, and it's, it's part of AP US history, but the term is Anglicization. And basically what it means is that over the course of the colonial period, something different happened than what most people think. The colonists didn't necessarily become more and more American over time. There's a lot, of, a lot of evidence that over the course of the 18th century, they're actually becoming more and more British culturally in their attachment to British uh, politics, uh, religion, their love of the king, all those different things. So I think style, it, style, culture, fashion, yes. yeah, architecture, all kinds of things. Yeah, all the you know tea sets, all the things that they, <laughs> all the all the consumption, and and so if you think about all of that, they really liked being British. And at the end of the, the Seven Years' War, also called the French and Indian War in 1763, they're super happy that they're on the winning side, that Britain has defeated France, and they feel like the freest people in the world. And the freest people in the world don't plan revolutions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so this is a very contingent event. I think it, it's, uh, in the words of uh, one famous uh, scholar, uh, John Murray, it's counter-cyclical. It goes against the grain of what was happening. Uh, that, you know, at, from the point of 1763, you'd expect these people to be ca Canada forever, <laughs> right? Um, but because of these different policies, uh, they changed. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe one factor in the delay to declare independence, make yeah. a public statement that uh, we are independent now, although yeah. the way that's even, even that's wor the way that's worded, are they saying we've been independent and now we're simply letting <laughs> you know, or we are independent from this day forward? Yeah, yeah. Um, was public opinion. Yeah. Uh, public opinion was still very mixed. Uh, you had radicals in the Continental Congress like John Adams who were ready to do it right away, or, or not quite right away, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, moderates like John Dickinson of Pennsylvania who uh, kept uh, urging caution to reconcile. Where was, do we, is it even possible to reconstruct public opinion during this period? Yeah, so this is a big thing that scholars are working on and it's, it's hard. And, and so we do have to do some broad generalizations with the numbers, but I think you know, generalizing broadly, we think that around 20% are very hardcore loyalists, that they're gonna stick with, you know, the king no matter what. We think around 30% or so, as of say July 1776, are strongly patriot, you know, pro in American independence. That leaves about 50% of the American population that's kind of on the fence. It's not really clear which side they're gonna go to, but another way of thinking of that is that there's a vast majority of people that are not supporting American independence at the point of the declaration. And that's why it had to be a persuasive document. And that's one reason why I think the war matters so much. Yes. Because the outcome of the war, individual battles in different areas, you see people switching from side to side depending on what army is controlling what area. And they have to also uh, yeah. prepare for a long-term war against the most powerful empire in the world. That's right. right. You That's need right. uniforms, weapons, ammunition, logistics, yep. all of that. Yep. So uh, that was an impulse to declare independence. Sorry to interrupt yeah, you there, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, we tend to yeah. think of the American Revolution sometimes as, you know, uh, elitists, yeah. you know, with their, you know, nice uh, colonial <laughs> attire in a room, yeah. penning treatises on enlightenment ideas. Yeah. There was a vicious war going on, in I some was. ways a civil war. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, incredibly vicious. And this is another thing that scholars have written about in the last decade or so, about really how grisly this war can be. And in some ways it's even, even you know, less civil, you might say, than, the, than, the, than our American Civil War, because it divides families, it divides communities, um, towns, uh, not just whole regions. Uh, and, Mob rule in and, some and, places. In some, Mobs yeah. would show up to yeah. a loyalist house, destroy yeah. his property, tar and feather him, yeah. expel him from the community. Yeah. There was yeah. a lot of mobbing. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the Boston Tea Party was a, an act of mob justice, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, and tarring and feathering, right, is the yeah. most famous case of that. I'm glad I've never, yeah. this never happened to me, right? <laughs> Going to the doctor is bad enough, can you imagine if that was something they were doing these days? Um, uh, so what, what finally tips the Continental Congress into declaring independence in July. Was it 
basically the king, I mean, the king does give a, a speech in October of 75. Uh, I talked about how he declared the colonists to be in rebellion in August. Yeah, yeah. And in October, he gives a speech to open parliament saying, you know, the rebels are authors and promoters of a desperate conspiracy. That yeah. news reaches January, about the same time common sense comes out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then there's the prohibitory acts, meaning all American commerce at sea is subject to confiscation by the yeah, Royal Navy. Yeah. But that still leaves us about yeah. four months away from July. So yeah. what's, the, what's the final kick in yeah, the rear? Yeah. Yeah, so all those things are incredibly important. I think the most underrated act is the Prohibitory Act of, of December 1775, because in addition to that, doing that with commerce, saying yeah, that... They learn about that in February of 76. Yeah, so that's like three months. Yeah, it takes several months to yeah. learn. One thing that act does is it says the colonists are no longer under the protection of the crown. And so essentially, Britain is saying, you're on your own, you're independent. The whole point of being a subject is that if you showed allegiance to the monarch, the monarch would protect you. And all of a sudden, what Britain is saying is, no, you're not under our protection anymore. You're on your own. We're making war on you. And so I think the culmination of all those things and then just the normal pace of del deliberation of Congress explains the July date. There's one other wild card thing that's happening. There's a rumor that's spreading in the American colonies that Britain is in discussions with France uh, and Spain to partition That's right. the, uh, their various holdings. Yeah. And it's, in essence, to give Canada back to France and to give Florida back to Spain if they help put down the American rebellion. We now think that the British uh, Navy actually planted this idea, that they started the rumor, to discourage the Americans from allying with France. How about that, in that? other words, you can't trust France. And so that rumor hits a fever pitch about June of 1776. Yeah. when a lot of these things are coming together. Well, that's yeah. a month prior. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we're working with perfect information now. Yeah, we yeah. have the benefit of giant books since 200 years And of all the things we still don't know, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> they didn't work with perfect information, yeah, and they were right. very much conspiracists. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. As we know from the early days of the Republic, yeah, the yeah. things that the Federalists said about the Republicans yeah. and the Republicans said about the Federalists. <laughs> yeah. So um, the declaration was, I guess, agreed on July 2nd. It's promulgated on July 4th, yeah. was it greeted warmly? Was it, was it a popular? Yeah, I mean, popular? I think, I, I mean, yes and no. I think, I think it certainly greeted warmly among that hardcore 30% yeah. <laughs> that I mentioned. I think, um, you know, as I said, Congress is lagging behind a lot of the country on that. That, you know, there has already been 90 declarations of independence. So in some ways it's kind of like, what have you been waiting for? Uh, so I think there's some relief and, and support there's also, there's also a lot of apprehension because, as we discussed at the beginning, just as they're declaring independence, Britain's real army is arriving. 30,000 troops. Yeah, up to that point, the British have been fighting with pretty small troops, small armies, and losing everywhere, yeah. <laughs> up and down the, the, the East Coast. Um, and that's going to change, beginning with the Battle of New York. Uh, referring to the pragmatic or yeah. more immediate political concerns that drove uh, the deliberations in the Continental Congress, were that the British were hiring mercenaries also, too. I mean, yes. They mean business, yes. essentially. Yes. We're, we're dithering here, we're talking, we're debating. Should we declare independence? Should we not? The British are sending an army. They're yeah. hiring mercenaries. They're coming to kill us. Yeah to crush our rebellion. Yeah, and I think one myth is that somehow the British uh, didn't try very hard in this war. They, you know, they could have done more to win. I think they're doing all they can. They're marshaling all the resources they can. Uh, the best historian on this is uh, Andrew O'Shaughnessy, oh, yes. a scholar at the University of Virginia and at Monticello, who's written a great book about the British side of things. Yes. And his argument is, these aren't dummies. These are smart people doing all that they can. Yeah facing a very difficult situation. I mean, in, in our own wars of the 20, 21st century, our counterinsurgent yes. wars, we know how hard it is. And we've got to, drones and nuclear yeah, yeah. submarines Every, and all this. Yeah. Things the British didn't have. <laughs> yes. the, the, the name of that book is The Men Who Lost America. Yep. That's it a, is, yeah. a terrific book. It, it actually is. opens with a chapter yeah. about uh, George the Third. It does, it does, yeah. Um, yeah. How, I was gonna ask you, how have How's the way historians teach the revolution changed? How about you? You've been at this a long time. We've been talking about, the, about it here during our discussion, yeah. but um, how, how have you changed the way you teach the yeah, war? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, hopefully I'm, I'm trying to read new scholarship all the time and bring in a lot of these new perspectives. When I started teaching more than 20 years ago, 
uh, the American Revolution was uh, almost the longest war in American history, second only uh, to Vietnam. That's right. uh, now, it's, if we're counting in a certain way, it would be fourth. It would be behind Iraq and Afghanistan and yeah. Vietnam. And those events couldn't help but, but, I think, kind of affect how we looked at it and I think how scholars have looked at it as very difficult, very difficult. And I, I, I think that sometimes when you're not immersed in this period and looking at uh, everything really closely, you know, it does seem like these magic words came down, you know, independence was declared, and it yeah. just happened. But when you get into the granular, you realize how difficult yeah, it really well, was. Yeah, nothing's foreordained, yeah. and had the king and parliament acted differently, there would have been a reconciliation. Of course, yeah. from their point of view, we're in charge, this is our empire, why would we let you secede without <laughs> without a fight, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And the taxes, oh, we didn't get to the yeah. tax. I mean, the whole, the, we <laughs> talk, no taxation without representation. Yeah, yeah. We made it through a podcast without <laughs> using those words. Were these taxes really that onerous? You know, they weren't in the sense of like how much money the Americans actually spent because a lot of them they actually defeat. They get repealed. Yeah. I mean, they didn't pay these taxes. Yeah, they didn't end up paying them. That was part them. of the problem. <laughs> and they were, less, the, they were less taxed than subjects in England. So. So when the British said, Americans, that you have kind of a sweet deal here, they weren't completely wrong, but it was, it was the principle of it. It was the no representation. And I would say what happens over time is the Americans, um, we might say they move the goalposts a little bit. They, they go from no taxation without representation, representation to no legislation without representation. They end in 1776 by saying, um, Britain, King George, we don't want you to do anything for us, <laughs> yeah. you know, taxes or anything else. And it takes, you know, we talked about how it took so long. Yeah. It takes those 12 years <laughs> to reach that point yeah. where they're ready to, you know, sever all the bonds. Yeah, because as you said, uh, otherwise life was pretty good for the typical person in the 18th century. You know, free white, free white man, yeah, farmer absolutely. or yeah. laborer, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Compa you know, not compared to today. Yeah, you have running water in those days or plumbing, indoor plumbing. Uh, you, you do get my point. But, but there was there was more material wealth yes. for free people in a free status uh, yeah. in America than there was yeah. in Europe. Yeah. And, and this gets into some of the finer points about government theory too, yeah. about parliament. Yeah. So. Um, I want to talk about what's going on briefly, what's going on now at George Washington University. <laughs> when I say now, I mean just in the last couple of years. Sure. The nickname for the sports teams is no longer the Capital C Colonials. Uh, we talked at the beginning of the podcast a little bit about how younger people, mostly on the left, view our past, uh, maybe don't see it as a source of inspiration, but say, well, you know, those, they were hypocrites, they owned slaves, etc. You wrote a piece, I have it right here, in the GW Hatchet. Uh, this is, I guess, the student newspaper. The student newspaper. newspaper. It's uh, always dangerous when a faculty member writes in the student uh, I know, newspaper. You know. <laughs> here comes the cancel mob. Uh, George Washington, you write, was never a capital C colonial. You basically said that the word colonial, well, you know, it's, it's not unreasonable to say that it has something to do with colonialism, but it yeah. actually was about a style of architecture. Um, yeah, so... But you're okay with the name change anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I support the name change. GW is now the revolutionary, so right on topic to what we're talking yeah, about. And that could mean Che Guevara, <laughs> Ho Chi Minh. I mean, a lot of revolutionaries Yeah, out we'll, there. we'll see, we'll yeah. see. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, but, um, but yeah, so this name, when I, when I joined the faculty in 2012, I always thought it was a strange name that didn't really fit George Washington very well because he didn't like the word colonial. <laughs> um, he was we, a nationalist. Yeah, he was a nationalist. And, and if, we, you know, if we could have the perfect name, it would be the nationalist. But our, our rebuilding baseball team has that name <laughs> at the moment. Um, and whenever he used the term colonial as a noun, which was very rare, um, or as an adjective, he thought of it as being provincial, small-minded. And he wanted, he wanted people in, in the new United States to think of themselves as Americans, not you know, in that provincial way that connected to their former colony mm -hmm. or yeah. state. Yeah. 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 So I and think and the young people who objected to the name, well, to them, that mean colonialism, right? And colonialism yeah, would, as a wretched history. I would say that the majority of the, the students that were against the name, that, you know, and, and I also told them, and I said, well, there's also a good George Washington reason <laughs> to, yeah, to, to change the name. Yeah. Uh, and also, last point, uh, there was a student essay. Actually, this was an op-ed in the Washington Post. A yeah. student at the university yeah. said that the university should change its name. Don't call it George Washington anymore. Yeah. Uh, your point is this was one student, one <laughs> opinion. The university is not dropping the name George Washington. That's absolutely right, yeah. So I was part of the what was called the naming task force. This set up the guidelines for how we might change different names of buildings or the colonials at, at GW. And the first decision that the committee took is that there will be no change in the name. 
And, and I have to say that uh, while there might be a person here and there that might hold those views, and, and we certainly support the rights of our students to, to share their opinion, um, there's no group or movement of students who wants to drop George Washington yeah. as the name. Now, I can't predict yeah, the course. future, but, but at least for now, I think we're content with being the, uh, the GW Revs. <laughs> yeah, my view on this when it comes to naming and statues yeah. and memorials is if somebody has claims to historical significance that are broad yeah. and not just slavery. Just that one thing, yeah. So Washington versus, say, the traitors who tried to destroy our country in 1860, yeah. the Confederates, yeah. Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, uh, Jefferson Davis, yeah. they do not deserve to have anything named after them anymore. Yeah. Their only claim to historical significance is secession, slavery, civil war. George Washington is different. That doesn't mean we should put him up on a metaphorical pedestal <laughs> either. Yeah. Yeah. We should confront yeah. his full legacy, right, as yeah. a lifelong slaveholder, etc. But uh, slavery also changed quite a bit too, from yeah. the 18th century yeah. into the into the 19th. Yeah. That that'll be a subject for another, <laughs> the, another, the next another podcast. Podcast. <laughs> So I don't know. Well, I guess final point is yeah. it's hard to pinpoint a single day as the start of our nation, especially since the Declaration of Independence doesn't create a government. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we're on our second constitution, the Articles of Confederation now, the yeah. current constitution. Yeah. But it's as good. It's as good as any. It seems July 4th. Yeah, I mean, I think in an official sense, um, you know, the, the people in the Congress, especially John Adams, thought that July 2nd was the magic day. <laughs> well, that, Adams that, was always a yeah. pain. Because <laughs> yeah. like, that's the day they passed the resolution for independence, yeah. and so it kind of makes sense. But it shows how powerful the Declaration was, that this document, which could have been just, you know, real plain and just kind of served a basic purpose of... One sentence. Yeah, it could have been a sentence or two. Yeah. It could have just been that resolution, you know, reprinted. The fact that it did have this inspirational language that is carried over you know, centuries, we're coming upon the 250th mm -hmm. anniversary of it, um, it is kind of remarkable that we do associate July 4th as our start, our start date. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm three years early on the, on the <laughs> well, we can do this again. Yeah, Denver yeah. Brunsman, yeah, George wonderful. Washington, yeah. this has been fun. Yeah. Everyone, thank you for listening and watching to this episode of History As It Happens.